90%, if not more, at least 90% of the men that I speak with, this is one of their main fears and concerns. Because to everybody else as well, they look like they've got it all. You know, to everybody else, they look like they've got the ideal life, they've got the business, the family, the home, the holidays, the car, the money. To everybody else, they are obviously buying into the facade, the mask, but behind closed doors, they just feel empty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Powerful Man Show. I am your host, Doug Holt, with my co-host, Tim, the powerful man, Matthews. Tim, how's it going, brother? Yeah, very good. Very good. On the last episode, I didn't get the image of crowd going wild. On this one, I did. It always makes me smile. <laughs> but to him, the powerful man, Matthews. Well, I, com- I, I committed a sin in any broadcasting as I was sitting down last episode, so I stood up for this one. Yeah, we've got to get some. Um, we've got to get the editors to put some kind of audience go wild kind of noise in on, on at least one of these episodes when I get announced. It'd be so funny. It would be. Well, Billy, who edits our podcast, as a side note, is actually getting married soon. So, Billy, congratulations to you and your beautiful future bride, my friend. Oh, wow, congratulations, Billy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tim, this is <laughs> switching gears here. Um, the topic for today that I want to throw on the table here, um, I'm going to call it, I hope they don't find out. And mm-hmm. what I'm talking about here, and let me ask you a question. Have you ever, this is one of those rhetorical questions, of course, have you ever talked to a person or had the experience where you're hoping they don't find out that you don't know as much as <laughs> they think you know, or you're not as wealthy as they think or smart as they think or that you have have it all together yes of course (laughs) (laughs) even you who hasn't you know who hasn't i mean i I can imagine the only people that really that don't experience that if anyone at all will be the guys that really aren't growing you know no no offense but you know it's when you come up against your your edges and you're growing and you you're striving for more often that these kind of fears come up. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this happens to a lot of us, and I'll I'll set the scene a little bit here, Tim, and and jump in at any moment. But the way this commonly happens is, you know, you the the man goes out, right? You go out into the public eye, whether it be work, uh, out socially, or if you're, you know, a power player and you're out networking at business events or even coaching environments where you're doing personal development, this happens quite a bit. Um, you go out and you put on your front, right? We call it in the powerful man, we call it the mask, right? We've called it that for years. But you put on your front, your representative comes out and you're like, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Oh, everything's great. How are you? Oh, kids, you know, whatever. Going back and forth, high energy. You're there, you're shaking hands, you know, you're, you're, you're making it work. You're showcasing everything, you know, just like you do on social media. It's the best of the best. Everything's great. And then you get home. You get home and your family experiences the real you, Mm -hmm. right? Not the public you. Mm -hmm. And so that's when things really happen, right? That's when you let your guard down, when you're short with your kids, you're snappy with your wife or your significant other, right? You're tired. You... You feel exhausted because you put on a front for so long. And then when you put on that front, it just drains you. And really what you're doing is you're saying, crap, I hope they don't find out, right? They, they think I'm the man, I'm a leader in my community, as many of the men that we work with are leaders in their business and their community as well as their family. I hope they don't find out, right? And then the man, right, the person goes back to the well where they get most of their significance and they go, well, if I just make more money, then that'll cover up all my mistakes, my happening, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. And they go in, they throw themselves into work. They work longer hours. They work harder. Really, usually only to end up in the exact same place, but definitely to end up more drained, more tired from putting on the front, from continuing the trade and from going on only to find themselves in desperation mode. That's one of the reasons we see that the man, male suicide rate so high is this perpetual cycle. Yeah, completely. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I have the privilege of speaking to all the men, you know, as they're coming into the activation method part of the screening process. 
And I would say that 90%, if not more, at least 90% of the men that I speak with, this is one of their main fears and concerns. Because to everybody else as well, they look like they've got it all. You know, to everybody else, they look like they've got the ideal life, they've got the business, the family, the home, the holidays, the car, the money. So <clears throat> to everybody else, they are obviously buying into the facade, the mask, but behind closed doors, they just feel empty. And because of this facade that they're showing up with to everybody, it's almost like the longer it goes on, the more they dig themselves into a hole and it's hard to feel like it's harder for them then to get out of it. Yeah. And then when they do try and speak up about how they're really feeling or what's really going on, a lot of people close to them will, will be like, come on, what have you got to moan about? <laughs> you know, people would love to have your life, which then makes them feel even worse because they're thinking, holy crap, I should be enjoying my life. Why am I not enjoying this? What's mm -hmm. wrong with me? And that perpetuates a cycle of, you know, waiting to be figured out. It reminds me of one guy, well, yeah, one guy in particular, <clears throat> and he was speaking on stage to some of the US's top financial advisors, you know, some of the, the, the top financial advisors. And he's been doing this for um, a long, long time. And it's like, you know, what he actually said to me is, he's up there with all these people looking at him and he's like, why the hell are these people looking to me for advice? Because he knows behind closed doors that he isn't stepping to the line in certain areas. And you know, this, this, this is a great man I'm talking about. He's such a great guy, a leader in his church, such a big heart, multiple businesses, but he just couldn't get away from this burden. It really was like a burden for him. He just couldn't get rid of this burden that was weighing him down. And obviously everywhere he went, it went with him. He got invited to speak on stages, gets paid tens of thousands. And he's like, I don't want to go. Mm. Making up excuses not to be there because he realizes that the more he's there, the more it fuels the facade. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, frankly, I can talk about my own story here. And there was a time in my life, you know, I'm in my twenties and I've been an entrepreneur for a very long time in my forties now, but I was in my twenties, Tim, in, um, in Santa Barbara, California, beautiful area. If anybody's ever been there, uh, I had a business on downtown state street, right? The main states, main area, high rent district. And uh, my business was, at the time, was a private training studio, right? Fitness, uh, very new concept at the time. And not many people had ever done it or thought about it. So it was a new concept in, in the marketplace. On the second floor, I ran a magazine and did consulting. And so I had these three businesses going. Um, at any given time, I actually had four at one point. But point being is uh, I had really high-level business mentors too. And they would tell me, you know, I was a single guy, you know, downtown, the youngest business owner, uh, bike by the beach, Southern California, you know, living the life, right? The real lifestyle here I had the fitness component. I had other businesses going on and very successful people would tell me how envious they were of me and how I had it made, you know, a young man, you know, here in this, this round, beautiful women all the time, you know, not only the trainers, but the clients, wealthy people, et cetera. And, um, I would often go out to, you know, public events and I, you know, I represented the business of course, and would go to the chamber of commerce mixers, rotary club, did all of those things that you're supposed to be. And was kind of, you know, not the man about town, but certainly people knew who I was and I was well respected. And I would go out with a smile, of course. Right. And I was working long hours running one business is tough enough running two businesses exponentially hard and you stack on other times on that. So obviously I had the best lifestyle possible, you know, women coming out of the woodworks, right? Young, successful entrepreneur, uh, you know, it was just ridiculous. You can imagine. Well, that's what everybody thought. And the truth was I would go home on a Friday night when everybody else was gearing up to go out. And even my friends who, who quite frankly looked up to me and envied my life 
were getting ready to go out. They didn't know I would go home alone and sit on the couch, pour myself a drink and watch movies. And I did that Saturday night and I did that Sunday instead of going out. Now, when it was a business event, I would go out, put on the mask, have the front and I'd be the guy, oh yeah, everything's great. You know, I'm going to travel. I got this business, this, everything's moving. And I would use that as a cover and perpetuate it. And the more and more people looked up to me, the more and more people thought I had this great, amazing life. And I did, you know, let's be real. I had a great life, but I wasn't fulfilled by any means. And I would turn to my business thinking, you know what? Someday when this business really cracks a million dollars in revenue, then I'm going to be happy. Then I can be myself. Then I don't have to put on that front. It was always that someday and I would turn to my business, Tim, over and over again, trying to produce more. Maybe if I start the fourth company, right, coming in, because I was getting people, everybody thought I was successful and happy and I had this life. And so it would build and perpetuate. And the more I would go out, the more I put on that front, the more that front kind of became who I was, but that took energy from me. And I almost became a codependent relationship with my mask. And it drained me over and over again. And all the time, I was so embarrassed and shameful. I was waiting for somebody to, have, to figure it out, right? And I hope they don't find out. And that wasn't a conscious thought. But looking back in hindsight being 2020, uh, that's what I was hoping. I didn't want people to know the hardships I was going through. You know, in fact, you know, here I am. Everybody thought I was filthy rich and all of these things, Tim. And something I've never shared in this podcast, and maybe you don't, I don't even know if you and I have talked about it, and it's certainly not something I'm shameful of now, but at the time I was, I actually moved into my office. I lived there, like literally lived there. I moved out, rent, you know, it's like 2008 hit, you know, with the market crashed. I didn't plan for it as successfully as I could have, and I moved in there, but I was so embarrassed and so ashamed And that embarrassment and shame caused me to put that front on even more so. And of course, fast forward to today, you do the work, right? You do the work, you do the dig work and and digging in, you realize what's really going on. But we see this same cycle and pattern so often with the men. And it's not their fault, right? Society has trained us. Society has trained you to put on this front, to put on this pattern, and not to allow yourself to be the real you. And the, ironic, the irony of all of this is when I started to be me, not just sharing and moaning or complaining and bitching and all that stuff, but when I started to be the real me, I started to have real connection with people, right? Deeper connection. Sure, I knew thousands of people, right? Or thousands of people knew me. At the same time, I didn't have any deep relationship connections, right? Except a few close friends I've always had, but I didn't have those deep connections because it was always the front that was being put out there. People were becoming friends with my representative that I was putting out in the public eye, not with the real me. And that's the irony we see all this time with people waiting for the the shoe to drop, for people to find out what's behind the curtain. Hey guys, I wanna interrupt this episode because I wanna talk to you about something important. We put together a case study on how almost 300 men have taken control of their lives. They're four Xing their business revenues and they're having more connected and intimate sex all without sacrificing their relationships or their health by using the activation method. Now, a lot of you have contacted us and they want to know how they're doing it. We put together this short 11 minute case study just for you. So you can see how these entrepreneurs are achieving this level of success. To get this case study, all you have to do is go over to thepowerfulman.com forward slash the number 11. Yep, that's one one. And you can get the case study right now. All right, it's only 11 minutes and it's going to show you exactly how these men have done it. All right, let's get back to the episode. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, I used to tell myself that when I get to a million dollars or when I get to whatever point, that's when I'll be able to be me. You know, it's that's the belief, isn't it? It's the belief that without these achievements or... Well, yeah, let's just say achievements, material possessions, status, whatever it is. Then until I have those, then I'm not good enough. So I'm going to pretend 
that I'm either further along than I am or that I'm someone that I'm not or whatever so that I can feel good enough. Mm. But all the time, the only thing that happens in that instance is that subconsciously what you're telling yourself is that who you are isn't good enough. When it, when it is, you know, we, we believe that every guy we work with is already a powerful man. That's our belief, isn't it? Every time we work Absolutely. with them, we see the powerful man that they are. They can't necessarily see it, but it's like, you know, Michelangelo's statue of David. Someone asked him, how did you create it? And he said, I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with the men we work with. And I'm sure the, the you and the people that are listening that, you know, you, you do not come into this world broken. You know, you come into this world completely worthy and good enough simply by being who you are. You don't need anything or anyone to serve as a, as a vehicle or validation that you are good enough. And, you know, obviously, you know, doing, you got, most of us <clears throat> have to do work to get to that realization and really embody it, just like you, Doug. Um, but just having that perspective, and also I think one of the key elements here as well is being able to surround yourself with other men that are in this kind of conversation as well. I think for me, when I was, um, when I went through something similar, you know, my, obviously I've shared my story quite a few times on the show, but that point in time when I just started sharing everything through Facebook, looking back at it now in the context of this conversation, I think what I was doing at that point was like ripping off the mask and being like, do you know what? This is me. You know, I took pictures of myself without any, you know, I had my boxer shorts on, but without anything on being like, look, this is what my body's really like. Mm-hmm. So I used to wear clothes that would, you know, make certain parts of my body look good. You know, arms would be sticking out and it'd be Friday. So you'd go to the gym and you work your arms on a Friday because you'd be doing something on the weekend or <laughs> whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, really just getting all the skeletons out of the closet. That was my way of making it so that there wasn't anything that I was waiting to be figured out for. I just thought I'd get it all out. And you know, the the most freeing thing, nobody cared. (laughs) (laughs) All these insecurities that I had, that I thought, you know, all these things I thought I had to be and do and achieve in order to look a certain way, nobody cared. Yeah. And they never do, right? Everybody's too busy worried about themselves is the irony about this. Um, and, and think about that. When you're, you know, we're, we're going off topic a, a little bit, but coming back, we'll bring it full circle. You know, when you're actually being yourself and sharing elements of yourself, vulnerability, it takes courage. It also creates the space for other people to be vulnerable and share themselves and share their imperfections, which actually creates more connection. So when we're thinking in, in our minds as men, you know, I hope they don't find out. Like I don't want them to realize that I don't deserve this promotion. And you know, when we coach high level of business owners and CEOs, this seems to happen more often. Like, oh no, they hope they don't know. I don't realize I know all the answers, right? <laughs> I hope they don't realize I don't know everything. Um, well, the truth is nobody does. And showing some humility and some, you know, personality and showing who you really are allows people to love you and take care of you. And you you and I are in unique positions with the companies that we run and consult for because we're very open and honest in those communities and our team will go to bat for us. You know, Tim, you fall down. You got myself, Mel, Arthur, Zaff, everybody else coming in and happy, one, taking care of you, make sure you're okay, but also picking you up. Be, and not because they have to, but because they want to. And that's the difference, right? Most people have businesses, they have employees who are just numbers and they don't know their boss or who they are and because their boss hasn't cho- chosen to be vulnerable and honest with them. And say, boss falls down, the employee just leaves. And they say, oh, I can't believe they leave me. I've been th- working here for six years. Yeah, but you haven't shown them who you are. You haven't shown them the real you. You haven't had an emotional connection with them, a human experience. And, you know, 
when we sit there as men, we're worried that people are going to find out the real us. You know, what's ironic is we allow people actually to like and fall in love with a fake us, meaning they don't like who we really are anyway. So why does it matter? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's such a, a burden, you know, living with the, the fear of waiting to be figured out. It's such a huge, huge burden. And um, like I said, at least 90%, I'd go as far to say it's much higher than that, to be honest, but at least 90% of the men that I speak with, you know, when I share with them that, you know, most of the guys we speak to at this stage are struggling with this problem and I'll share with them basically this the context of this conversation. And you just, you, I can feel the relief come from them. Ah, oh, yes, that's me. And for them to, one, know that they're not alone, and two, know that they're understood is just such a huge, like I say, relief for these guys. It really is. And obviously they go through the journey of doing the work to be able to overcome that and really accept and fall in love with who they are without the need of any successes or material possessions to really mirror that back to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Tim, in wrapping up, let's give the guys a couple take homes. You know, we like to give homework here and actionable responses. So what are a couple of things the men can do right now after listening to this to avoid the, I hope they don't find out syndrome we see so often. What can they do right now? I would like for you to pick three people who really mean a lot to you. I'd like you to ask them the question, what is it like to be in a relationship with me? I'd like you to pick the three people that you feel the most resistance towards asking. You know, those couple of people that just popped into your mind and you thought, holy crap, I'm not asking them. (laughs) Ask them. (laughs) They're the ones I want you to ask. And the reason why I want you to do this is because this has the potential, if you choose to do it, to open up a conversation where they're going to share their experience of a relationship with you, you know, from which you can then share your experience with them and what is your desire and what you want to create together and, you know, what usually happens in this conversation is that you realize what comes out of the conversation has nothing to do with money or material possessions, but everything to do with connection. Often out of this conversation, what you see is that the people closest to you, the people that you ask, just want to spend more time with you (laughs) often. Mm -hmm. Um, And that comes from a pure place of love for you being the man that you are without any of these possessions or achievements or successes. The real you, right? They want to hang out with the real you. Yeah, exactly. Excellent, guys. Well, this is a wrap for today's episode, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episodes. We'd love to hear what you think, your thoughts and your comments, and please leave a review wherever you see this. That's how other men find this recording, and that way we can further grow the movement and unchain a bunch of other men just like you.